All right, so this week we're going to be talking about environmental justice and the so-called justice system. So the system of police and courts and so forth that uh, we have in our society. And the cover image there is of some prison inmates who are working as firefighters in California. And that's the case study that you're going to be reading more uh, about that connects environmental issues to uh, the justice system. But in the lecture, we're going to talk, you know, kind of more broadly about some of these issues. So we're going to first deal with the idea of corrective justice as a, a dimension to our thinking about justice in general. Then we're going to look at inequalities in how justice is administered in the United States today. Uh, and then we're going to connect it up to the uh, issue of the environment and look at how environmental justice may be an issue for people who are in prison. So to start off, we have the idea of corrective justice, which is a dimension to justice that kicks in when injustices are getting committed. So before we've talked about the idea of substantive justice versus procedural justice. And those two dimensions to justice were both about defining which things are just and unjust, which kind of uh, things should be approved of and which kind of things should we say are are not right so corrective justice comes in when the whatever standards we've set for substantive and procedural justice are violated when somebody commits an injustice goes against what is substantively and or procedurally right what do we do then how do we fix that problem how do we uh, address the perpetrator of this injustice so that's the the sorts of questions that we're asking when we're thinking about corrective justice. And so that is the dimension of justice that the things that we call the justice system are dealing with. Right? So the system that involves things like police forces and uh, courts, they're trying to administer corrective justice. And in particular, they're trying to administer it on mostly an individual kind of level. They're looking at specific individual perpetrators who have committed some sort of an injustice and uh, you know what should be done with those individuals. Larger structural issues of justice are usually handled through the political system. Right? So by passing laws and stuff through Congress or state legislatures uh, or whatever, that's usually how you address the bigger structural types of issues, though you can have a court case that has a big structural type of impact. If you look at famous cases like you know Brown v. Board of Education that got rid of separate but equal supposedly uh, schools or the various cases in state and eventually federal courts that uh, legalized same-sex marriage. So those were court cases that all centered on a specific individual's case, uh, but then eventually had this larger structural ramifications. But those are unusual. Right? Most of the operation of the justice system is dealing with individual level issues. And so that means that that individual level enforcement can actually end up reinforcing structural injustices if you've got bad laws on the books. If you've got unjust laws that are on the books, then the police and courts are going to enforce those unjust laws and create injustices in all these individual cases that, uh, that they're dealing with. And I think it's important also to keep in mind here when we're talking about this justice system that we sometimes take for granted things that are really unusual in the grand scope of human history and across different kinds of societies and so forth. So this model that we're really familiar with, where we have this professionalized police force, you know, a whole bunch of people whose job is to go hunt down and arrest people who've committed crimes. Uh, and then the idea that the primary way we punish people is through a calibrated term uh, in prison, right? The worse the crime, the more years we sentence you to uh, in prison. That whole idea is a relatively recent innovation that it developed in the 1800s in the United States and Western Europe and then kind of spread through uh, much of the rest of the world. But most people for most of history haven't lived under that kind of uh a system. We generally did not have a professional police force. Uh, it was usually the other members of your community that would, you know, come after you and would uh, 
would take care of you know finding and uh, apprehending perpetrators of uh, crimes and there has been a, a wide variety of other sorts of punishments that have been used in uh, various societies at, at various times besides uh, being put for a long period of time into uh, a prison uh, so you have various forms of corporal punishment you know uh, flogging and uh, you know, cutting off people's hands and those kinds of things. You have exile was a major one for a lot of uh, societies. You have fines being used much more heavily in a lot of other societies uh, than ours, where a fine is usually like, you know, the, the light punishment if you don't quite make it to the threshold of going to jail. Um, and a variety of other sorts of, of things have been used uh, historically. So the specific model that we have uh, today is a relatively recent innovation, which means it's not the only way things can be done. And so we should uh, be willing to ask the question of, is this the right model uh, for, for doing things? So if someone has uh, been, you know, accused of a, a crime and then convicted, uh, you know, we've shown that that person has done that, what do, are we actually doing when we try to punish them, right? What is the purpose of putting somebody in jail or using one of these other sorts of punishments that we might have? And there are actually a whole bunch of different things that we might be trying to do. And sometimes these things conflict with each other so that trying to do one of them undermines doing another. So I think it's important to be thinking about if you're advocating to punish someone for doing something wrong, uh, what exactly is it that you're trying to accomplish by this. So one possibility is incapacitation. You're just trying to make it so that someone can't uh, reoffend, can't commit the crime again. Right? So if you put somebody in jail, then that protects the people outside of jail from that person, you know, committing that crime again because, you know, they can't get out to uh, can't get out there to do it may also be aiming at deterrence. So if people who commit crimes get uh, punished in a certain way, then that's going to discourage other people from committing crimes if they fear getting uh, apprehended and punished that in that same way. So by attaching consequences to it, you deter people from committing uh, future crimes. You could also be looking at rehabilitation, where you're going to turn the offender into a law-abiding citizen. Uh, you are going to fix whatever it is about them that led them down this path of crime. And so exactly what rehabilitation constitutes depends on your idea of what it is that causes people to commit crimes. Uh, so uh, is it a lack of kind of moral fiber? Well, then you need to teach them uh, how to be a good person and instill good values in them. Is it, uh, you know, a lack of job skills so that they had no other options but to turn to crime? Well, then rehabilitation would be about, you know, job training. Is it, you uh, you know, a variety of different things that we might imagine leads people to crime, then if you're aiming at rehabilitation, then you're going to try to fix whatever that is uh, about people that turn them into criminals so that then once you let them out of jail, they'll become good law-abiding citizens. You may also be aiming at restitution. So there you're trying to repair the damage that was done by the offense. You're trying to put right the thing that was uh, done wrong. And so in some cases, that's very straightforward. If the crime was destroying something of value that belonged to somebody else, then restitution means replacing that thing, you know, giving someone equivalent value to the thing that was uh, destroyed. In other cases, it's a little trickier because you can't exactly put right the thing that was uh, done wrong. But you can, you know, try to approximate that. And that's where you get things like people being... Uh, being charged money for pain and suffering that if you're like sued for for harming somebody and there's a, a pain and suffering kind of uh element to what uh they're they're asking as punishment the idea there is that that money will in some way make up for the suffering that the victim experienced uh you know and it's Money can never exactly trade off with uh, that kind of suffering, but it at least sort of kind of makes up for it. Right? There's a restitution-based uh, idea of punishment. 
Punishment can also be expressive. So the point of punishment is to send a message about society's values. So even if that punishment isn't actually changing anyone's behavior, and right, it's not rehabilitating anyone or deterring or anyone, people may still want to punish someone as a way of making a statement that, you know, this conduct was wrong, we as a society don't approve of it. And then punishment may simply be revenge. So this is the idea that offenders deserve to suffer. That if you harm someone else, then it is right for you to suffer some sort of proportional uh, suffering. Again, even if that doesn't deter you from committing future crimes, it doesn't repair any of the damage that your crime did, people often have a sense that offenders deserve to suffer in some way, and that it would be unjust for them to uh, escape from uh, that suffering. Again, even if there's no other benefit uh, in terms of things like deterrence that might come from that punishment. So you can see how specific sorts of punishments might serve one or the other of these goals better or worse. The things that do one of these really well might uh, be very bad at uh, accomplishing another one of these. And so this is something important to think about when you're imagining you know, wanting to punish someone who has done something wrong. You're thinking, you know, this person uh, committed an injustice. We need to get them. We need to, uh, you know, make them pay for it. Well, what exactly do you mean by make them pay for it? You know, what is it that you're trying to accomplish by punishing them? Okay, so let's move on to talk about how justice is actually carried out in the United States today. And I'm focusing on the United States because that's uh, where I can, you know, grab some good statistics from uh, and so forth. But, you know, it's some similar issues often crop up in other parts of the world as well. So we find that the administration of justice through the so-called justice system in the United States is extremely unequal with respect to race and ethnicity. So lots of different statistics will show you that black, Latinx, and native uh, people in the United States are over-policed relative to white people. That is, they have a lot more contact with the justice system and are a lot more likely to uh, be punished within that system. So more likely to get stopped, more likely to get arrested, even if there are similar levels of crime. So uh, drug crimes are one really clear uh, instance of that. So people of all different races use illegal drugs at roughly similar rates. So, you know, if you're looking at... Uh, you know, black people and white people who are demographically otherwise similar, they're going to use uh, illegal drugs at roughly the same rates, right? Roughly the same percentages of people using uh, using illegal drugs. But black people are much more likely, something like twice as likely, to get arrested for their uh, illegal drug use. So there's a lot more of this uh focus on by the police on crimes being committed by certain uh, racial groups of people. And that can also include targeting of innocent people. So people that haven't actually done anything wrong have to worry about the police stopping them, questioning them, uh, even sometimes taking them in because they assume they must have done something wrong. So you may have heard the expression driving while black uh, that sort of emerged to describe this phenomenon where uh, black drivers who have not done anything wrong will still get pulled over by police who, you know, saw some little thing and it triggered suspicion in them because they have the stereotype of black people as likely to be criminals. And so, you know, whatever little thing didn't seem quite right to the officer will lead them to pull over uh, a black driver where they wouldn't have done the same to uh, a white driver. And so lots of, uh, you know, people that haven't even done anything wrong end up getting uh, pulled over. You also see this with, you know, people being stopped on the street by police uh, and so forth. And so the end effect of this is that far more people of color end up being under the control in some way of uh, the justice system. So one out of 11 black adults in the United States is either in prison or on parole. So out of prison, but still uh, subject to uh, 
rules and so forth uh, as a, a punishment for some sort of uh, crime that they've been convicted of. Uh, and you know, you report to a parole officer and having restrictions on where they can go uh, and so forth. So this is one dimension to racial inequality in the United States is this much greater involvement in uh, the justice system by uh, people of color. And so in addition to the racial dimension, which is one that has gotten a lot of public attention, there are also other dimensions, other axes of inequality can also uh, have lead people to have unequal uh, contact with the justice system. So poverty is another one. The people who are poor are more likely to you know, get arrested, get convicted and so forth, spend time in jail than uh, people who are well off. And then disability is often linked with uh, with worse outcomes in the justice system. Uh, that uh, people who have various sorts of disabilities will find themselves uh, treated more harshly by police. So police will, you know, say, well, somebody wasn't making eye contact, so that means that that was suspicious, and so therefore I arrested this person or, uh, you know, used physical force on this person. But maybe the lack of eye contact wasn't that the person was, you know, suspicious and, uh, you know, trying to hide it. Maybe that was because they were autistic and autistic people are uncomfortable with eye contact. Or, you know, the police will say, well, I, you know, told this person to stop and they didn't stop. So I had to, uh, you know, violently take them down. But maybe that person was deaf and they didn't hear you say that, you know, they didn't hear the officer say uh, to stop. Uh, so... You also see these inequalities with respect to other axes like uh, disability as well as uh, race. And another uh, important aspect to this is that prisons can be big business. So we have several major private prison companies that make quite a, a lot of money over uh, from building prisons and uh, housing prisoners. These corporations often lobby for harsher sentencing uh, of prisoners because that that means more prisoners that they get paid uh, to house. And a lot of uh, remote localities see prison building as a source of jobs and economic development. And so you'll read about one case uh, not too far from here up in Forest County, uh, but this happens all over the country that if you are kind of out in the middle of nowhere and you're trying to figure out, you know, what kind of industry can we bring to our town that's going to provide jobs for our people and, and spur economic development, uh, building a prison will often seem like an uh, attractive one uh, because prisons being in remote areas is often seen as a, a good thing because you ship your prisoners way out there. And so, you know, if they got out of prison, they wouldn't have anywhere to go. They're cut off from their uh, community and so forth. And so many remote towns have sought out prisons as a sort of economic development uh, avenue. And it you know, creates some distorting effects on the administration of justice if certain people stand to profit a lot from people getting arrested and, and put uh, in jail. Uh, I used to live near a town called Florence, Arizona, which is a major prison town. Uh, they kind of brag that they have more prisoners than people in the town, uh, which tells you what they think of the prisoners if they don't count as people, right? But if they're more prisoners than non-incarcerated residents uh, in the town, there are signs all over the place saying don't pick up hitchhikers uh, because, you know, they might be prisoners who have uh, escaped. And practically everybody in the town works directly or indirectly for the, the prison system uh, in that town. And one of the reasons that prisoner uh, building prisons is such a uh, such a profitable enterprise is that it's real easy to squeeze those prisoners for profit because they're totally under the control of the, the guards and management of the prison. Right? They are totally subject to whatever, uh, you know, rules and things are, are forced on them. Uh, and they're unsympathetic uh, 
for the larger population, right? If prisoners get uh, treated poorly, lots of people on the outside will say, hey, well, they're prisoners, they committed a crime, they deserve it. You know, I don't care if things are bad for them, or in fact, people may say, no, it should be worse for prisoners. We should be treating them, you know, even more harshly because, you know, they're bad people, they committed crimes. Uh, so it's really easy to do things that uh, gain you more profits at the expense of the, uh, expense of the interests and welfare and rights of the people in prison. So you get things like, you know, the food being served in prisons being extremely low quality and even uh, unhygienic. Uh, so you have people, you know, having to eat uh, moldy and rotten food because that saves money for the prison. So they get more profit because they're not buying, you know, decent food or, or cooking it, uh, cooking it well. You have uh, prisoners being charged exorbitant amounts of money to use the phone or to uh, have visitations, uh, which are increasingly being done through televideo technology uh, with their friends and family members uh, who come to visit them. Uh, because again, they have no other choice. You know, it's not like, you know, if if my phone company started charging me uh, too much money, I could switch phone companies. Uh, but if you're in prison, you can't do that. You you either pay it or you don't get to use uh, the phone. So there's lots of ways that uh, the, the companies that run uh, prisons as well as government agencies that run prisons, because there are also, in addition to private prisons, there are a lot of... Uh, you know, prisons run by the federal government, state governments, uh, county and local governments, and they're sometimes doing some of the same things because if they can save money in their budgets on uh, stuff for prisoners, then they can put that money towards other things and it makes them you know, look good uh, to their, their bosses and so forth. Okay, so let's now talk about prison labor. So uh, we saw this in the, the picture at the beginning. You'll be reading about the specific case of firefighters uh, in uh, the Western United States. So there's a, a whole variety of jobs that prisoners work at. So uh, a lot of manufacturing gets done by prisoners. You have prisoners used to uh, harvest uh, crops, you know, agricultural labor. You have prisoners who operate uh, call centers. Uh, it's just a huge variety of different things that prisoners are uh, are doing. And depending on where you are, the pay for that ranges from very low to nothing at all. That, uh, you know, prisoners do this work uh, essentially for free. So in Pennsylvania, the typical wages for prison laborers ranges from 19 cents to a dollar uh, an hour. So far, far less than uh, the existing minimum wage and even farther down from, you know, what a lot of people will argue is a, a reasonable living uh, wage. So much less than you could get anybody on the outside to do this kind of work for. So the people that are employing this prison labor are saving an awful lot of money by using prison labor rather than hiring uh hiring non-incarcerated people who have the option to walk off the job and, and go get a different job that's going to pay better uh, if they don't like what you're paying. So, you know, we have prisoners doing all this kind of labor while they're in prison, but then once people get out of prison, having a criminal record will often inhibit finding employment. There are a lot of jobs that people will just not be able to get because, you know, their employer will run a background check on them, will find out that they've been convicted of some sort of crime. And even if, you know, they've served their sentence and, uh, you know, kind of paid their, their debt to society, that criminal record will still uh, mean that they're not able to get hired for a lot of jobs, including sometimes the very jobs that they were doing while they were in prison. So that had become one of the major issues with uh, incarcerated firefighters, that we have lots of prisoners doing this, uh, this work, and then they get out of prison and you can't get a job as a firefighter if you've got a criminal record in a lot of states. Uh, so they weren't able to continue doing the thing that they could do while they were uh, prisoners. So that's kind of the two sides to the prison labor issue is the uh, extremely low pay uh, and uh, often coercive conditions under which people work while they're in prison. So when people are doing this uh, prison labor, they're sometimes very directly forced into it. They're told, you're gonna go do this work now, you don't get a choice about it. 
other times, even if they have formally kind of have a choice, they're allowed to not do it. Just the opportunity to not be in your prison cell all the time exerts kind of a coercive force on people that the alternative to doing this extremely low wage labor is so unpleasant that, you know, it's not really a free choice uh, to go do it. So they have sort of that side of what happens while people are in prison. And then you have the other side of people not being able to get jobs once they get out of prison because they have this uh, conviction on their record. And so when we put this together with the uh, racial inequality in who is actually going to prison, a lot of people have uh, highlighted the fact that there's this prison labor clause in the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So 13th Amendment passed in 1865 uh, after the Civil War that was intended to eliminate slavery. Right, so that was, you know, what had been accomplished by uh, the North winning the Civil War, uh, among other things, was to eliminate slavery. And so we put this into the Constitution with the 13th Amendment, which says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So we have that clause that says that involuntary servitude uh, is still allowed as a punishment for a crime. So you can't just enslave a whole race of people just because you want to have slaves to do your work for you. But if people are convicted of a crime, then you could, under the 13th Amendment, uh, essentially treat them as slaves. So this has led a lot of uh, activists to argue that prison labor is essentially as they, a modern day substitute for a return to slavery, that you have this system that allows this uh, involuntary servitude to continue. You just have to go through the motions of convicting people of crimes first. And so we have a, a system that is disproportionately uh, pulling people of color, especially black people, into the prison system where they're then able to be exploited for this uh, you know, labor that is paying almost nothing or in some cases absolutely nothing uh, at all. Counterpoint to this uh, analysis of prison labor as uh, simply a, a return of slavery is the fact that for most prisoners, you're not doing labor in prison. Most prisoners are idle and bored. And, you know, that's actually the problem that a lot of people suffer in prison is that you're in there for a very long time with very little to do. Uh, prisons often severely restrict the kind of activities that you can do while you're in prison. They have strict limits on the books that you can access, strict limits on whether you can use any internet services. Uh, you know, they don't allow you to have like games. Uh, so I read an interesting article recently about prisoners who were trying to play Dungeons and Dragons in prison, and they uh, would get their dice confiscated because you weren't allowed to have dice in prison. They would they like made paper dice that they could roll for their Dungeons and Dragons game, but those would get confiscated, and their pencils would sometimes get confiscated by the um, by the guards. So for a lot of prisoners, uh, the problem is that they've got nothing to do. And in fact, that's why people are willing to work for so little money, because otherwise they're just sitting around, uh, you know, without, uh, without anything to occupy themselves. So if the primary function of the prison system is to, you know, provide this supply of essentially slave labor, they're imprisoning a lot more people than they're actually making use of uh, as, as labor. So now let's connect this to the environmental dimension. So if we've got prisoners as a distinct group of people and a group of people that have very little control over the environment that they experience, then we can easily imagine that those prisoners could be put into bad environmental conditions, could experience worse environmental conditions than people who are, are not prisoners, people who have more freedom to move around uh, in the environment and make uh, their own environmental uh, choices. And in fact, environmental conditions in prison often can be very unhealthy. So we could look first at the internal conditions, at the, the prison itself as an environment. And we've talked before about, you know, the importance of looking both at sort of outdoor environments as well as indoor environments as areas where environmental justices can occur. 
So internal conditions can include things like issues of temperature control. So there are frequent complaints from prisoners in prisons all over uh, the country about the temperatures in the prisons being uh, set in ways that are uh, ranging from uncomfortable to actively threatening to people's health. So prisons in you know hot environments like the Southwest will have bad air conditioning or no air conditioning, and so prisoners are uh, you know suffering heat stroke. Uh, in the prison and prisons in cold environments like up here in the northeast uh, will have the heat turned down in the winter and so prisoners will be suffering from uh, you know cold and, and even uh, you know frostbite and so forth uh, in extreme cases so uh, temperature issues are, are a common um, common complaint because prisoners don't get to control their own thermostat generally that's controlled by the uh, you know the the guards and so forth, uh, and to save money, they'll often uh, either deliberately turn that temperature control uh, to use less energy, so it gets too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, or there will be maintenance issues that don't get fixed because the people who decide when maintenance happens are not the same people experiencing uh, the the effects of the unmaintained um, the unmaintained heating and cooling uh, systems. Another dimension to the internal environment that can be threatening to prisoners' health is exposure to disease. If you've got large numbers of people packed in together in prison, if one person uh, gets sick, uh, whether there's somebody that you know was sick when they were first uh, put into prison, uh, or it could be something brought in by a guard who you know caught something outside and, and passed it on to a prisoner. If you've got all these people packed in this uh, closed environment uh, in close proximity to each other, sharing air that's circulating within the prison, you can get diseases spreading really rapidly. And so I've a uh, note on the slide there, COVID-19 has been uh, a major issue in this respect, that a lot of major outbreaks of COVID-19 have happened in prisons uh, because somebody in the prison got sick with it and it spread really easy to the remainder of the prisoners. And uh, the health care that's available to people in prison is often uh, of very low quality. They don't have enough uh, staff and enough access to drugs. There often is this idea that prisoners are, you know, should suffer uh, because, you know, they're bad people who committed a crime or that uh, they're suspected of malingering, you know, pretending to be sicker than they really are uh, as a way of getting out of the, the jail cell and so forth. Uh, so healthcare for prisoners is often uh, at a pretty low, uh, a pretty low standard and that exacerbates the spread and the suffering from uh, a disease like COVID uh, when it gets into uh, a prison. Then there's also conditions coming from outside of the prison that impact on the environment experienced by prisoners. So prisons may be built in areas where the environment is very polluted, where there's significant air, water, soil uh, pollution on that site. That may be, you know, an easy way to kind of offload a, a brownfield site, you know, a polluted uh, site, is to build a prison on it because the prisoners don't get to choose whether they live there in the same way that, you know, non-prisoners might uh, avoid facilities built on a, a brownfield site. And so that can expose those prisoners to those various kinds of pollution. And then you also have exposure to diseases that are coming from outside of the prison. And so one of the articles that you've read for this week deals with the case of valley fever, which is a fungal infection that is common in uh, the southwest United States. And when uh, dust get kicks up uh, in a, a desert environment, then that dust can bear the spores from that valley fever. People will breathe that in and, uh, you know, get infected by that. And so Prisons that are located in these desert environments uh, can expose their inmates to valley fever because, again, prisoners don't have a lot of control over their own environment. It's hard for them to take precautions against uh, that valley fever. And the health care that they may get if they start to get infected is uh, substandard. And so it allows the, the infection to develop and uh, spread within the prison. So there are a number of different ways that people that are in prison can get exposed to negative environmental uh, 
conditions as a result of their incarceration. And so that's going to be both an inequality between prisoners and non-prisoners, but then that's also going to be an inequality along racial lines because who is in prison and not is racially uh, unequal. And so to wrap up, we can talk about, well, what might be done if we decide that some of these things that are happening uh, to people in prison are problems, are injustices, what might we do about it? How might we go about fixing? And so you'll hear people arguing for both prison reform and prison abolition. So I want to talk just a, a little bit about what each of these things uh, entails and so therefore which of these might be a more uh, suitable solution to the kinds of uh, environmental injustices that we've talked about in this lesson. So prison reform is about improving the conditions in prison. So we're going to have people in prison but we want to fix the injustices that they suffer. So prison reform can involve eliminating uh, abusive practices that are harmful to prisoners and don't uh, you know don't actually accomplish anything for those intended goals of uh, punishment that we talked about before so these are things like overuse of solitary confinement uh, so lots of people uh, in US prisons end up getting stuck in solitary confinement for extended periods of time as sort of an additional punishment for uh, things that they did while they were in prison. And there's lots of, of psychological evidence that solitary confinement is just really bad for people, that it's extremely harmful uh, mentally to a person to be in solitary confinement for extended periods of time. Um, or then there's things like, you know, the overpriced phone calls uh, and extreme restrictions on access to books in prison and so forth. These various sorts of things uh, people have deemed to be abusive or, or harmful practices in prison. So we can get rid of those and that will make the prison experience uh, more humane uh, and less unjust. With respect to prison labor, that can mean having fair pay for prisoners. So rather than getting 19 cents an hour uh, to uh, do this prison labor, you get paid a fair wage that's comparable to what somebody who's not a prisoner would have earned from uh, doing that kind of uh, work. And of course, along with that, you know, not coercing people into taking these uh, prison labor kind of jobs and giving them a, a genuine choice about uh, whether they would want to uh, work in whatever uh, capacity uh, might be offered to them. And then you also have the idea that prisons ought to take a much more rehabilitative focus. So between all those different sorts of uh, goals that punishment is aimed at, prison reform advocates tend to uh, want to focus on rehabilitation as one of the more important ones. So we are going to use prison not as a opportunity to hurt prisoners for the sake of you know making them suffer for their crimes, but as a chance to essentially fix them so that they'll be better people uh, and law-abiding citizens when they get out. So that can involve things like job training so that people have skills that they can use to get a decent paying job where they won't be tempted uh, by crime when they get out. It may involve therapy. So if someone's crimes may be somehow linked to a uh, you know, mental health issue, you get them good care so that they can uh, deal with that and, again, not uh, cause those kinds of uh, offenses when they get out of prison. So that's, a, a, in a, a very quick sketch, a prison reform kind of approach. Then you also have people advocate for prison abolition, which means get rid of prisons uh, and, you know, the that word abolition, right, which we usually associate with uh, people who are against slavery, or that's a very deliberately cho chosen word because the prison abolition uh, position is based on the idea that prisons are just inherently wrong, that putting people into these, you know, areas of confinement for extended periods of time as a, a punishment for crimes is just something that there's no good way to do that. The prison, that you can't reform a prison enough to uh, to stop being unjust. And so instead we need to get rid of prisons. And that doesn't mean just, you know, close down the prisons and, and go on as before, but instead it means finding a different way to address the offenses that are done by people. Because, you know, even if we get rid of offenses that you think shouldn't be offenses in the first place, right? Like we only legalize marijuana. And so then all the people that are in jail over uh, marijuana related offenses can go free. There are still things that people do that, you know, prison abolition and people will absolutely agree are, you know, 
wrong that we need to do something about, right? Murder and, and so forth, right? We, we still need to address uh, those. So instead, we need to uh, think about getting at the root causes of that crime. Now, what can we do to keep those crimes from happening in the first place, rather than just punishing people after the fact when they uh, commit them? And when people do commit uh, crimes, you know, because you're never going to completely eliminate crime. There are always going to be people that break the rules in some way, no matter how good those rules are, no matter how good your systems for steering people away from breaking those rules are. Uh, you know, when people still do end up committing uh, crimes, prison abolition tends to take a restorative kind of approach. What can we do to repair the, the, the harm to society that was caused by uh, that crime? What can we get the, uh, the offender to do to fix what they broke in the process of their offense rather than just how can we uh, you know, make this person suffer uh, to compensate for the harm that they cause. So that in a very brief sketch are the ideas behind prison reform and prison abolition. So when we come together as a class, that's one thing that we can talk about in terms of the appropriate response to some of the environmental injustices that can uh, affect prisoners. So I will see you in our live class.